food for our souls. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen, amen. Wow. John chapter 4. Moving on a little bit. John chapter 4. As you're turning now, let me remind you of the, the top 16. John chapter 4. Remind you of the top 16. Your top 16 are as follows. Did you meet this week at least once? with someone, with each other, to pray for one another, to confess your trespasses to one another, that you may be healed. Did you know someone this week that you could speak freely and plainly with about the state of your soul, about the faults that you may have committed in word, thought, or deed, and the temptations that you may be drawn to? Do you have the forgiveness of sins? Have you peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ? Have you the witness of God's Spirit with your spirit that you are a child of God? Is the love of God shed abroad in your heart? Is there any sin in or outward that has any control over you? Do you desire to be told your faults and your trespasses or your sins? Do you desire to be told all of your faults, trespasses, and sins directly and to the point? Do you desire that you should tell that someone should tell you from time to time whether uh, whatever is in their heart concerning you. Seriously, do you desire that others tell you what they think, what they fear, and or what they hear concerning you? In other words, do you desire to be with your whole heart to be accountable in your mind, body, soul, and spirit? Are you willing to be completely transparent in all the areas of your life without exception, without disguise? And without reservation, do you carefully abstain from doing all forms of evil? Do you zealously maintain good works? And do you consider yourself a bondservant for Jesus' free? John chapter 4. Uh, interesting story. Many of you heard this story many times before, I'm sure, about this uh, woman at the well. I was all set to just go full blast into it and try to, uh, you know, get something really exciting and uh, just kind of get into it, kind of bypass all the little things and just get right into the meat of the story. But uh, I couldn't go there. Uh, there's this point. There's this uh, reason uh, of Jesus. Uh, John chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. Let's read those first together. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. But he needed to go through Samaria. Do you have that one? No outline. Where are they all in? Might be on the. Uh, <coughs> see that, Mr. John? I couldn't multitask. Uh, who's fast? Marky's fast. <laughs> Want to run to the office? Yeah. They're in there. Mr. John's fault. There he is. <laughs> you did it. Where are they at? They're like laying near the um, copier. The little one. Yeah. I mean, by the hole puncher, they're already punched. Yeah. Uh, so you'll want the outlines, of course, to follow along. But um, Like I was saying, this story is uh, it's very familiar, but yet there's a point here that we want to really look at this morning, this idea of being needy. It says here in verse uh, 4 that Jesus, he needed to go through Samaria. He needed to go through Samaria. We 
see that? You asked me if I can if I can multitask, John. Good job. Yeah. He was. Uh, he said I could, and then I punched the hole wrong. Well, I thought it was my fault. Well, yeah, you were standing there. Oh, good, good. Yes. Just trying to job mark me. Sure, just figures. <laughs> but of course, you were led by the Holy Spirit and found them anyway. Yeah, that's Thanks be to God. <laughs> Thank you, kind sir. Well, the first thing you notice in John chapter 4 is this conjunction, therefore. Uh, now, if you've been at least through the fifth grade, you'll know that therefore is a conjunction. And the conjunction here expresses, there's two things this conjunction does, what purpose it serves. One is that it can express an external connection between two sentences, therefore, you know, you have a sentence, then you have a therefore, and then you have a sentence. You know how we used that before. And, and that therefore connects the two sentences. The other purpose it could serve for is uh, some kind of uh, internal relation of a cause and effect. And that's really what, what we're talking about here. So this therefore is referring to the sentences or the statements that John has made and written prior to J John chapter 4 verse 1. So if you kind of go backwards, this is why I started reading backwards and never really knew why until I finally found out about this conjunction. It makes sense of why you want to read backwards. So if you go backwards up to the last therefore, which is in John chapter 3, verse 29, he makes another therefore sentence there. He says, therefore that this joy of mine is fulfilled. And then he's referring back to the bride and the bride bridegroom picture he draws. But in verse 30, he makes this statement again. He says, he must, he's referring to Jesus. John the Baptist is stating, Jesus must increase and I must decrease. Now again, you've got to get this. This is really important. Again, this is John describing uh, being the forerunner of Jesus. For instance, John was the forerunner. He came before Jesus. And now that Jesus has come, now John can step out Oh, out of the way kind of thing. He can go step aside and Jesus can kind of take over. The problem with this statement is that many of us in, in Christianity have made this a theology. We've even made a song. And this isn't a theology uh, of Christianity. Uh, you know, more of him, less of me kind of thing. As if, okay, right now it's, it's uh, you know, I'm struggling today. It must be 80% me, 20% Jesus. Uh, I'm having a better day. It's 50-50. You know, hey, we're, we're kind of balanced together, me and Jesus. Uh, hey, that's a real good day. It's only 20 me and 80% of him. You know, Jesus is in control 80% of the time. I'm in control 20% of the time. That's not what John is getting at here. Uh, John understands that it's got to be all of Jesus and all of me. This is why we make that statement. There's two people living inside of you, you and Jesus. And he wants all of you not just a percentage of you. He just doesn't want you to kind of decrease out of the way, give him 70, you take 30 kind of thing. Uh, we've tried this in marriages. Uh, we understand that uh, you know, it can't be 50-50 because if it's 50-50, then you, know, you never really meet. We used to say that in marriage counseling a lot. Yeah, if it's 50-50, you know, hey, you know, that kind of thing. Some days i got to give 80. Sometimes she only gives 20. You know, most of the time she doesn't only give 20. You know, that whole thing, we have a real bad time here. But, but basically, if you really understand the, the oneness of marriage, it's all of me, all of her, all of Jesus. All of us working as one. Which is a whole lot different than a percentage kind of thing. So John's not getting at percentages here. He's, at, he's always at relationship stuff. So he goes on to say it, and he explains it, which is really interesting, because if you just stop at verse 30, you can go write a nice song, and we can make hits about it, and it would sound good, singing down the road, but it doesn't make real sense theologically. Look what he says, verse 31. He who comes from above is above all. And he who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. And what he has seen and heard, that he testifies, and no one receives his testimony. 
He who has received his testimony has certified that God is true. This is what we talked about last week when we said the authenticity of your Christianity can only be certified through the outpouring of your heart and your life. That's what we said last week. So, and what John writes, and what he has seen and heard, that he testified, John the Baptist is speaking, and no one receives his testimony. He who has received his testimony has certified that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God. For God does not give the Spirit by measure, meaning does not give the Spirit percentage-wise, doesn't give it spirit um, sparingly. He outpours his spirit. It, it flows like a river overflowing. See, when you don't receive dribs and drabs of the Holy Spirit, he pours himself all over you. You get absolutely soaking wet on this one. See, it's not like, well, I was good 80% of the time this week, so I'll get 20% of the Holy Spirit kind of thing. Well, I was this part, and then he gives me this part. If I'm this good, he gives me this amount. And when I'm really good, oh boy, he gives me a whole lot more. That's not how he pours out his Holy Spirit. You get all of them, or you get none of them. Make sense? So for he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God does not give the Spirit by measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe the Son does not see life, for the wrath of God abides on him. Now remember what we said about that. He who believes the Son, he who has intimate relationship with the Son, has everlasting life. And he who, it's not just, oh, I don't believe, it's, it's not just that, it's he who is disobedient, which means the pouring of the Spirit has come, but you've rejected it. And in your rejection, you, you're living in the wrath of God. Because you're an enemy of God if you don't have God. So he who believes in the Son is everlasting life. He who, who does not believe, he who lives disobediently, the Son shall not see life. He who does not live in oneness, in right relationship, does not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Therefore, so this is, this is what he's getting at. So the therefore is referring to what he's already said. Now, in that, look what happens with Jesus. When the Lord knew, gnosko, that's the intimacy word, right? When he knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize, but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. So he's getting ready to make this trip. He's going to go from where? Judea. And he's going to go to Galilee. But verse 4 gets stuck in there. Verse 4 has, again, another conjunction. It says, but. But Jesus needed to go through Samaria. He needed to go through Samaria. See, I found that I'm, I'm really needy. Oh, yeah. Really needy. Uh, and, and in that idea of being needy, um, I used to hear this statement a lot in the church. And it, it kind of went like this. Uh, God always doesn't give you what you want, but he, he gives you what you need. And I kind of I kind of embrace that for a while. You know, you have wants, you have needs, you have desires kind of thing. And God doesn't always give you what you want, but, he, but people used to say, but he always gives you what you need. And that seems to make, make sense, doesn't it? It's one thing to want something, but it's another thing that God is just to give you what you need. He, he meets your needs. Kind of. Not always your wants, but he meets your needs. Amen. So I had... I had embraced that for, for a long time until I started studying this. Oh. Yeah. Now there's a problem. I, I, this problem has, has come up. And the problem is, now, is what I think I need. You know, God gives you what you need, so now I focus on what I need. The problem is, 
What I think I need may in fact be what I want. <laughs> That's a problem. Well, yeah, you know, because you told me I got to meet my needs. So if I got focused on my needs, then I wouldn't really think about my wants. But the problem is now maybe my needs have really become my wants. And that could be a problem. You know, with the fact that I think I really need may be what I really want. And that's a problem. You know, a want. A want is, is lacking. You know, you're lacking something, so you want. There's a deficiency, so you want. There's a need. And this is what got me, because when you look at want and you look at need, they're really the same. On the surface. You can't really tell the two apart. We can try to, um, you know, semantically, with our language, we can say, well, hey, not my wants, don't give me my needs, we won't give me my wants, and hey, I'm so hard to worry about my wants, but what I need. And, and we're okay with that. Until you get to that point where <laughs> are my needs my wants? Which is really kind of confusing. So this idea of want is a, is a lacking, it's a deficiency, it's a, it's a need, it's a craving. So this is where we come up with this proposition this morning. When you need like Jesus needs, then you know you're one with him. When you need, like Jesus needs, then you know you're one with him. For instance, the big question is this morning, which comes out of that whole idea of wants and needs, is are, are all my needs, my wants, I'll throw this in for King James, and must-haves, I think King James says there, must-have, he must go... Are all your needs, wants, and must-haves must needs. my like it, love it, and gotta have it? <laughs> are, they, are they God's will? You know, God's will, man. God's will for your life. Who, who wants to live outside of God's will? So all your needs, all your wants, all your must-haves, you know, it's where we come up with that statement so many times. Uh, this is why we do what we do. You know, I was watching a show last night. It was, uh, what was it, Detroit? Detroit. Uh, SRT. Yeah, they are not business. They were um, SRT. SRT. They're, uh, what do you call them? Joel, where are you, Joel? Where's Joel? Special Tactical Forces, you know. And they go in. What do you call that? Special Force. You know. SWAT team, yeah, man, SWAT team. And the guys kept saying, hey, we just, let's go do what we do, man. Let's go do what we do. Let's just go do what we do. Wouldn't that be interesting if, if the church would just do what they're to do? Wow. <laughs> just do what you do, man. So we would change it, of course, and say, let's just be what, what we're to be. Let's just be what we're supposed to be, the church. What's it mean to be the church? Let's do what, what we're supposed to be doing. But in that... All our needs are, wants are, must-haves are, are like it, love it, gotta have it kind of stuff. See, are all those, is all that just in God's will? So, here's my, here's a, here's a point. So what if I come to this realization that my, my needs are really my wants now, so what if I enter into a relationship with Jesus where all of my wants are his wants? All of my needs are his needs. All of my must-haves are his. All of my desires are his. See where I'm going with this. So there's this, again, there's this, this oneness in this relationship we have with each other. And you guys already talked about it in worship this morning. Uh, so, you know, I mentioned the whole thing with the prayer warrior idea. Teach me to pray the prayers you want to answer. I'm not just praying and hoping that, uh, you know, hoping that there'll be this answer or wondering if there'll be this answer. But I'm already praying the prayers that he's already going to answer. Because I'm so into his will that, hey, there's no question about it. There's no unease. There's no unrest. There's just this joy and there's this peace all through it. See, I... That's how you can get ready to be stoned to death and you're saying, Father, forgive them. They know what they do. That's how you can hang on a cross and say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. 
Well, this is what's going on here. So Jesus is on this trip, and he's getting ready to go from Judea to Galilee. But he needed to go to Samaria. This idea of need, this is a necessity, it's an obligation, it's a lack of something required or desired, something required or desired that is lacking. It's an extreme want. So again, that's where that line is blurred between want and need. Being needy is being in need. But the word here, the Greek word here, of course, for that word, uh, needed, or I think King James says must, must need, must need is D-E-I, dei. It must be. It must be. It is necessary. Jesus needed to go to Samaria. It is necessary. It must be that on his way to Judea, uh, to Galilee from Judea, that he must go to Samaria. Now what's interesting about this word is that this term uh, denotes an element of necessity where that word need comes in. So that's why they translate it need to a particular uh, action or event that's taking place. But it's most precisely linked when there's this idea of this compulsive power. Now this is good. This compulsive power. Again, that's where we say stuff like, why do you do what you do? What compels you to do what you do? There's this compelling, there's this compulsive power within you that empowers you to do what you do. Let's go do what we do. Man. Nice. Compulsion, to be compelled. Literally means to drive together, compelled. To drive and together, together. To force, to get or bring about by force. See, it's the why you do what you do. And if you look through the Septuagint, if you look through Josephus, if you look through the New Testament, this term has become plainly written out by most scholars to mean and relate to God's personal will rather than a neutral faith. All just happens. Ah, he just decided to go there. No, this is God's will that he's going there. And the reason why he's going there is God's will. Yes. See, wouldn't that transform us in our everyday life? See, that we just didn't just have a need or just didn't have a want and we kind of acted on that need or want. We said, okay, well, it's a good need, so I'll go ahead and do it. So, But no, but that you're actually living in, responding to the revelation of God in your very life every moment of the day. That's what we've been talking about. Kingdom Revelation series. So the actual, what's actually going on here is that Jesus is going from Judea to Galilee but he's got to go to Samaria. He needs to go. Matter of fact, it's God's will that he goes. And Jesus always lives in the will of God. Matter of fact, he left his mom and dad because of God's will. So he wasn't a disobedient teen. He didn't have a wild hair. He didn't have to go sow some wild oats. He was in the temple because it was God's will. That's why he did what he did. It's God's will. See, you do what you do because it's God's will. I mean, it just he's just all over you. He's flowing through. There's the outpouring of the Spirit in you. And why you do what you do is because you are completely compelled and empowered by His Spirit. That's why you do it. Think about the last time you blew up at something. Think about the last time the sound booth gave you a hassle. Sorry. Whoa. Warning, warning, Will Robinson, right? I mean, come on, right? Yeah. I mean, that's the deal, right? Is he in control or he's not in control? Whoa. <laughs> See, it's not so much that he's that we believe he's in control of the situation, but he, but he really needs to be in control of me, yes. which is even more important. Yes. Amen. Because if he's not in control with me and he's in control of the situation, I'm still in control, which is bad. But if he's in control of me and I can say he's not in control of the situation, I don't really care about that because he's still in control of me. Which is bad. We've had to choose, but I think he's in control of all. Let me look at some examples here. 
uh, same word. Luke chapter 22. Check this out. Luke 22, verse 37. Try to understand this word, needy. Because you're needy. I'm needy. We're needy. Yeah. Luke 22, 37. Look what he says here. Big star, if you have a nice uh, reference Bible there. Jesus said this in Luke 22, 37. For I say to you that this which is written must, there it is, must still be accomplished in me. It must still be accomplished in me. It's God's will. It must be accomplished in him. Understand it? It's, it's God's will. Uh, Acts chapter 9. A couple other interesting ones. Acts 9 6, uh, 9, 6. You remember this one? Uh, Paul's on a, on a similar road, he's on his way to Damascus. But the will of God enter beans in Saul's trip. And Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Paul, Saul responds, who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, and then verse 6, so he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And the Lord said to him, arise and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. That's the word. Yes. See, it's not must do like, hey, uh, it's a commandment, i got to do it kind of thing. It's a must do, it's, it's God's will. See, it's his plan, it's his purpose. See, wouldn't you be more apt to go with the flow of that if it was God's will as opposed to it's something you have to do? See, if you have to versus you want to. See, I want the people who want to be here, not the ones that have to be here. You know what I mean? I had a bunch of people that had to be here. They felt like they had to be here because it was their duty. It was their reason. Uh, you know, it's church. i got to go kind of thing. you got to check my name off. i got to go to church because it's Sunday. That's what I've done. That's what I always do. But, if you have a group of people who want to be there, who are there because it's just a compulsion inside of them versus a a uh, have to versus a want to. See the difference there? Yes. Hey, you have to do your homework. Oh, that's drudgery, man. That's painful. But if you somehow, some way, by the power of the Holy Spirit, of course, get so enwrapped and enraptured in that thing that you want to do your homework, oh, Whoa. what a transformation will take place. Uh, you know, I have to study. Man. See, I have to do my devotions because if I don't do my devotions first thing in the morning, I have a horrible day. You know, it's like reading tea leaves kind of thing. It's like going in the newspaper and getting the uh, the horoscope or the funny section. You know, and reading your, or you know, Chinese getting the, getting the, getting the note out. Well, how am I day going to be? I don't know. Let me look at the paper and see. Oh, I don't know. Is this the day the Lord has made? You're going to rejoice and be glad in it. Yes. Or you can read the fortune cookie. See, it's a whole, and it's a mindset, man. It's a whole inside deal thing. Uh, uh, Acts chapter 16. Oh, wait, don't turn yet. Go right to 9 6, and verse 16, 2 has one. Yeah. For I will show you how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Remember that? He must suffer. Say he must suffer because you know you're bad. You see, you were bad and you didn't clean your room, so now you must suffer. See, it's not that kind of thing. This is this is God's will, God's plan thing. It's a whole different deal. Uh, Acts chapter 4. Let's go back for a second. We're closer there. Acts 4, verse 12. Same idea. Peter and John, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we, what? Must be saved. There's the word. It's God's will, man. Saving will. 
Acts 16. So you're getting the, the gist of this, right? It's not it's not legalism stuff. You must have to. It's want to. It's desire. It's inside compulsive power. Man, when I saw that in that definition, it just it just gripped me. This compulsive power. Why do I do what I do? Well, hey, is Jesus running wild in you? That's why you do what you do. Well, I still do what I do when I want to do it because somebody else is living inside you. Well, yeah, that's true too. So, but who's got you, man? Who's gripped you? Acts 16.30. Oh, you remember the scene here. Paul and Cyrus are in prison, and the uh, the prison guard comes out. He notices that the prisoners are gone. He's about to kill himself because they had a much better fate. There's the word, right? If he goes and kills himself. But see, God's plan wasn't that he just go and kill himself, because that would be the right thing to do, because your prisoners got away. But Paul says, no, wait a minute. We're here. We're not. And we didn't go away. Don't kill yourself, man. And then the guy falls down on his knees trembling and he says, Sirs, what must <laughs> what must I do to be saved? See, how, where does he come up with that? Did, did Paul flip him a four spiritual law track real quick while he was on the ground? I mean, where did this guy come up with this idea? Did Paul have a sign that said, okay, we're here. You must be saved. You must be saved. Repeat after me. And then the guy says, hey, what must I do to be saved? Or do you think somehow, someway, the Holy Spirit of God came upon this Dirty, rotten scoundrel saw the love of Jesus in his captors' lives and his heart was strangely warmed to come up with this statement that says, what must I do to be saved? Wow. Right? Yeah. Paul's not, hey, repeat after me, baby, come to the altar kind of thing. It's like, oh, what must I... Something's happened. He knows that he should be dead. For all intents and purposes, for all practicality, the way it is is this way. This is the way it's always been done. I'm a guard. My prisoners are gone. You guys got out. I kill myself. That's the way it goes. But somehow, some way, I am begin. I am giving, receiving some kind of loving grace. You had those two together. It's like, well, what must I do to be saved? It's a big deal. Uh, and you, you see this all over. This word is all over the place. 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, verse 25. I'll just read it to you. You can write it down. 1 Corinthians 15, 25. Uh, Paul's talking about the uh, resurrection of Christ and the resurrection of the dead and the end times kind of stuff. And he's talking about Jesus' reign. And he gets to verse 24 and it says, Then comes the end. And when he delivers the kingdom of God uh, to God, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power, verse 25, he must reign. That's Jesus. Jesus' reign. He must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. That's the same word. You go over to verse 53 in the same chapter. You're looking at the resurrection and transformation there, verse 53. Paul, Paul's describing the physical, the spiritual, the resurrection of both. And in, in verse 52, uh, uh, in a moment in the twinkling of an eye in the last, in the, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruptible. You understand that that says that this corruptible body now puts on incorruptible this new body this physical resurrection kind of thing right right and this mortal must be put on the mortal must put on immortality thank you Jesus right yeah okay that's the word and then lastly might as well finish it off here second Corinthians 5:10. get another uh, Messianic prophecy uh, about the judgment. For we must we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Wow. See how how you arrive at the judgment seat it's, it's like quality of life stuff. It's not the issue of eternal life, it's the quality of life, right? Where are you going to spend eternity? 
So this whole idea of appearing, it's not I must, you know, because there's a court order, you must appear before the judge. See, that's not a good one. You don't like to receive that one. But see, if you must appear and you're in right relationship before the appearing, you've got no problem with appearing. Matter of fact, you want to appear. That's right. You remember, first and second uh, Genesis, oh yeah, they walked in with God in the cool of the garden. They wanted to appear. They wanted to be with God. They hungered and thirsted to be with Him. They hungered and there was a compulsion to speak with Him and to relate with Him and have relationship with Him. But Genesis 3 comes along, man. They're running, baby. They're hiding from God now. They don't want to hang out with God. They don't want to meet with God anymore. It's a whole different deal. Uh, so that's a big deal. So let's go back then, John. And I'll show you one more in John since we're going back here. In John chapter 3. Of course, I missed it kind of when we were going through it the first time. But in John chapter 3, verse 8, what, remember what we said there? It was 3 8. Or was it 3? About 3 7. What did Jesus say? Not normal that I said this to you. You what? Must. You must be born again. See, is it you must be born again before I hit you on the head with a bat? Or is it you must be born again because, man, that's just God's will for your life. See, God's will for your life is that none should perish. For God so loved the world. See, that's his plan. That's his purpose. That's his heart. That's his desire. God is love. Yes. Oh, man, do I have to be saved next Sunday? I really don't want to be saved. Things I want to do, things I have to do. You know, I, I got wants, I got needs, I got oats to sow. I can't just, I can't go and be saved next Sunday. Is that how we look at all this? Well, you know, he pointed his finger at me, and, you know, I shook my fist, but he pointed again, and I shook my fist, and he pointed again, and I thought, oh, I must be saved today. I better go up there, because he's going he's gonna to point me out again. He's going to tell my parents, I don't know what he's going to do. i gotta, I got to go. <laughs> or, or, or when you get saved, man, I mean, when you understand this, there's this compulsion, there's this, there's this inside deal that's just inside you, and he draws you, his spirit draws you. The love of God is poured out all around you, man, and you can't help but say, yes, Lord, yes. Or did you get saved because you were just scared of going to hell? See, that's, that's huge. Hugely different. That's a good word. Hugely different. So let's look at this real quick. So here's John chapter 4. Jesus, he's going. From Judea to Galilee. Now if you just flip to the book of Maps for a second, if you have it, you'll notice that from Judea, the normal track or trek for those who would be going to Galilee would be basically right up the River Jordan. I mean, you'd follow the river north, you'd miss all the big mountains kind of thing, and you'd just go right up straight up to Galilee. I mean, normally, practically speaking, I mean, if you plug it into your GPS, man, you know, the camels had GPS back then. And, and, you know, the normal business practice, I mean, the way everybody goes, I mean, just the way you should go, is straight on, man, just, you know. But for you to go to Samaria, it'd be like, it's out of your way. And you hate to go out of your way, don't you? I mean, you just want to get from point A to point B. That's right. And if you have to go out of your way, man, it just completely messes up your day. I mean, think about the last time you tried to cross the tracks. And you thought you timed it right. And the 504 came at 508, man. And you were mad because you were there at 503 to beat the train. But then you had to wait for the train. And as that train was going that way, you noticed another train was coming the other way. And now you're really furious. So you back up, do a 180 on the road, head on down Dixie Highway, trying to beat the train down the other side so you can pass the road. I've seen you. I've seen you driving. I've seen you do it. Whoa. But see, Jesus had to go wanted to go to Samaria. 
But he won. I mean, he's a Jew. Remember that. Jesus is, is Jewish. And if you just read the scripture, it says, you know, down to, down to verse 9, it says, Samaritans and Jews have no dealings with each other. Uh, there's problems with the Samaritans that the Jews have seen. I mean, it goes way back, way back in history. Uh, Samaria was a place that had been under, under great influence from a lady named, uh, you might know her, Jezebel. Yes. She was bad, man. Bad, bad, bad. Talk about the wicked witch, man. She was ten times worse. And they were under this influence of Jezebel. They became a center for idolatrous worship. Whoa. Samaria. So you know no Jew's going to go to Samaria. I mean, it breaks the law, man. I mean, come on. The good Samaritan. They wouldn't even go near the person on the side of the road. They'll walk around the other side of the street. Not to go next to the Samaritan person. Remember Ahab? He had some issues. Uh, Ahab had, had built the house of Baal in Samaria. And then he, then he reared up an altar in Samaria. I mean, think about the stuff that's going on. And if you're not quite sure how bad the Baal and the Jezebel thing is, you read Revelation about that too. Because <laughs> that's bad. So the Samaritans, they were kind of considered, here's a funny term I found, Israelitish. You know, it's kind of it's kind of like uh, church and ease, maybe, like we've used. Yeah. Uh, they're kind of, sort of, kind of Christian, sort of, kind of Israelitish was the word I found. I thought it was really funny. They were inhabitants of the northern kingdom, but they were people of mixed origins. Uh, where they came from was they were brought by, uh, by the conqueror of Babylon. And they took the place of the exiled Israelites. This is going back like 700 B.C. Uh, look what it says in 2 Kings about them. 2 Kings 17. Really interesting. Uh, I'll read it to you. 2 Kings 17, uh, verse 29. Real fascinating. Second Kings seventeen twenty nine. I'm mean, it's all over, but just twenty nine. However, every nation conquered to make gods of its own and put them in the shrines on the high places which the Samaritans had made. Every nation in the cities where they dwelt. That's the kind of people they were. It's this mixed origin kind of thing. But it's kind of interesting because something had a something attached themselves to the Samaritans. Because if you look over, we won't get to it today, but if you look over what the, the woman at the well says in verse 12, uh, she's making reference to oh, verse 5 even. He, so he came to the city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Now Jacob, of course, is what? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? So you can see why they're calling them Israel lightish. I mean, Christian light, you know, that kind of thing. Oh. <laughs> yeah, are you? I'm Christian. I'm not Christian. I'm, I'm Christian light. What's that mean? Well, you know, Sundays, I'm good. You know, maybe Wednesdays, but not, not the rest of the week. I'm a little light. And then you go over to uh, verse 12. Are you greater than our father Jacob? So she's referring to her father as Jacob, which is interesting because the Jews would say, who's their father? Abraham. Father Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. So you can see the term Israelitish. So they have some kind of history, Jewish history, but they're Samaritans, but they're kind of a half breed kind of stuff, you know. It's kind of a mixed deal. So the Jews just said, hey, but we're just going to stay away from them. But Jesus says, I. I I've got to get there. I am, the Father is willing me there. There's this compulsion, man. There's this desire. I mean, what was it? I mean, this is out of the way. There's no reason to go there. There's no practical, common sense reason to go there. Yes. 
See, if you're, if you're living your life with common sense and practicality and business one-on-one, uh, you just blew the first one here. You broke, it, you broke the first rule. Because there's no reason to go there. I mean, what was it? Was there a new wall that opened up? Yeah, that's why I'd go there. Brand new wall all opened up, and I'm going. So why would you go there? There's no reason to go there. No reason to go out here. Oh, but he goes. So he breaks rule number one. First of all, he he takes he goes off the charted course. You know what the plan, man? What the mission statement says, man? We're going down the chart, and this is the way we're supposed to go. And he does a just goes completely out of the way to get there because there's this compulsion, there's this desire, there's this leading of the spirit. This is how Jesus lived his life. He was led by the Spirit to go into the wilderness to be tempted. See, the plan says, the the practicality is that don't go there because that's where you're going to be tempted. Go there. But Jesus goes there to be tempted. Why? Because he wanted to prove he's better than you? No. He's going there because the Spirit's leading him there. Hmm. See, do you go where you go because the Spirit's leading you there? Or do you go where you're supposed to go because it's just the right thing to do? Just makes sense. It's different in the kingdom than the world. Uh, The next thing we notice with Jesus is not only does he go out of his way to get there, but he goes and now he begins to speak. Breaks rule number two. Speaks. Remember the Good Samaritan. They walked around the other side. Didn't want to do anything with it. Didn't want the wind blowing that way. Didn't want to get the stuff of the the half-beat, half-dead guy on them. So they went around. Jesus goes to. Uh, You've been there. Um, You know, somehow you got off the road. You know, you were going somewhere. I don't think I'm in Detroit some more since I was watching that show last night. We were down going to a ball game or something, and, and we just took a wrong turn, man. Took a wrong turn in Detroit. Bad thing to do. Oh, uh, you're driving down the road. You don't want to stop. You don't want to ask directions. You don't want to talk to anybody. Uh, you don't want to make eye contact. <laughs> you just want to keep on going. Matter of fact, if you need gas, you're going to pull up to a gas station that says full serve because you're not going to get out of the car to pump your gas. You might crack the window a little bit, stick a dollar out there so you can get some gas, but you're not getting out of the car. You've been there. See, if you're a Jew, you just don't talk to these Samaritans. You have no, verse 9, you have no dealings with these Samaritans. But Jesus begins to engage her. See, he's living out his purpose. He's living out the will of God. He's gone out of the way. It doesn't make sense, but it doesn't matter because it's God's sense, not your sense. Remember what, what Paul said about God's wisdom and man's wisdom. So, he says to her, give me a drink. Disciples aren't there. They go to buy. They went down the Waha. See, they went to, there was a Waha. They went down the city by food, and then the woman, woman of Samaria, said, "How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink?" It's so startling to her that he would speak to her because it's just for centuries, man. Centuries. This has not been hasn't been done. It's just so out of the ordinary. Wouldn't that be a help for the church today? To step out of the ordinary way of doing church and get back to the extraordinary way of this New Testament Jesus. So he begins and he engages with her. Give me a drink. How is it that you being a Jew ask me for a drink? A Samaritan woman. Not only is she Samaritan, she's a woman. For Jews have no dealing with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have 
given you living water. See, it's not bad enough that he goes out of his way and goes to the city of Samaria. See, it's not bad enough that he goes and he talks to this woman and begins this conversation with her. The third thing that happens here is that he, he begins to get top 16, man. He begins to get real intimate with her. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. I mean, he gets out of the car, man. He goes into the store. He begins conversation. And he gets right up in her grill, man. I mean, with this stuff. He gets right into the heart of the matter. He goes right into the, the very discerning part of her, her, her person, man. He goes right inside and can discern through the power of the Spirit what her deal is. And the very reason that he goes to Samaria is to speak with this woman about the, about the uh, thought and intention of her heart. Amen. That's right. And you thought he just wanted to check out the new wall wall. And you thought his GPS broke and he just went left when he should have went right. Because with the, with the common eye, with the business savvy, man, it makes no stinking sense why he does this. But with kingdom eyes, he can't help himself. He's got this compulsive power within him. And he goes where the world says he shouldn't go. And he says what the world says he shouldn't say. And he gets right up into her business where the world says, you better not, you better not go there. You know, if you go there, she'll, she'll turn her back on you and, and never talk to you again. She'll leave your church, man, if you tell them about that. Well, she may... She may not. Whoever drinks of this water, verse 14, that I shall give him will never thirst, but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up in everlasting life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I might not thirst, the, nor come here to draw. Jesus said to her, call, Go, call your husband and come here. All she had to do was go get the guy, her most recent attachment, and bring him back. That's all she had to do. He would have never known. Whoa. But he, she answers and says, well, I have no husband. And he says, well, she's not lying. You said, well, I have no husband. For you've had five husbands. And the one you now have, now have is not your husband. In that you spoke truly. So isn't it interesting that when you're confronted with the word, you have an opportunity to speak truth. The truth is in front of you. Yes. Will you speak truth in return? Well, it says, oh, I perceive that you are a prophet for sure. Our fathers worshipped on this. Remember going back now. So she's this Israelite-ish kind of thing here. She's got some, some little bit of background in, in Jewish culture and religion. And what happens to her? She goes. She look at this, verse twenty eight. She leaves her water pot. Sound familiar? Like they left their nets and followed Jesus. She left her water pot, her livelihood. See, without the water pot, she can't get any water. What is she saying by leaving her water pot? She's going for the new water, man. The new water, which doesn't need a pot. See, I'm the pot for the new water. Now, not the pot we used to carry around with us. I'm the pot of this new water. So I don't need my new pot. Don't need my net. I'm not a fisher of fish. I'm a fisher of men now. Don't need my nets. What do we hold on to in the church, though? What do we hold on to? We hold on to our pots. We hold on to our nets. Whoa. Think about that. Ah, that's one of the day. So 
she goes into the city and says to the men, come see who told me all the things this could be. And look what happens here. Then, then they all went out of the city and came to Jesus. So now, look how, you understand how crazy this is? She goes down, calls the men. The men are listening to a woman. <laughs> could you imagine listening to a woman? I mean, that'd be like, I don't know, a woman leading worship in a church and she just goes off in the morning and she's telling you the, the compulsive power in her heart. That would never happen here. Whoa. Yeah, baby. Way to go, honey. See, this is what we're talking about here. Whoa. She goes, the men believe, and look what happens. Verse 40, or verse 39, so many of the Samaritans in the city believed in Jesus because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me everything I ever did. And then they came out and believed, and then they got to know Jesus more. They said, hey, we don't just believe what you said. We now believe because we know him. Yes. So this, this city that has given itself for years and years to the spirit of Jezebel, to the spirit of Baal, has now, is now beginning to give itself to Jesus. All because somebody chose to go off the beaten path. And isn't that interesting? That it wasn't really his choice. Oh yeah, we believe in choice, but do you understand that when you have this compulsive power within you, it's like it's not like, well, do I choose this? Do I choose that? You don't have this battle to choose right and wrong when you have this compulsive power within you. It's not a battle to do right versus do wrong. When the Holy Spirit of God is running wild in your life, there's no issue with those thoughts, man. There's no issue with those words coming out of my mouth. There's no issue that, well, I do right, well, I do wrong. That's not an issue anymore. It's huge. See, when we need like Jesus needs, then we know we're wrong with Him. Yes. Absolutely. Without a shadow of a doubt. Oh, Lord Jesus. Oh. I want my needs to be your needs. I want my wants to be your wants. My thoughts to be your thoughts. My desires to be your desires. What you hunger uh, for makes me hunger. Oh, flow through me, Lord Jesus. Captivate every ounce of my being. So I just live in the flow of your power, the compulsive power of your Holy Spirit. So I just am what I am because you are who, who you are. It's not a question of, well, if I do this, I'm a Christian. If I don't do it, I'm not a Christian. No, never again do I have to stop wonder, well, should I, should I not? Should I, should I not? He loves me, he loves me not. He loves me, he loves me not. No way, man. Getting out of that worldly mentality and just getting into your kingdom, this kingdom flow of the power of your Holy Spirit. What you call us to. That's why you left. The reason you left didn't make sense, didn't want you to go, but the reason why you left is so that you could now live inside of us. Because if you stayed here in physical form, you couldn't live in all of us at the same time. But since you left the, and your spirit came, now you can live within us. We can be the water pot. Man, we can be the nets. We can be the temple of the Holy Spirit. Oh, may it be so. May it be so. May we never again step out on you, Holy Spirit. Mm. May we never again do our own thing. May we never just look at our own needs, love it, like it, love it, gotta have it. May we never get wrapped up in all that and just get wrapped up in you. So that every time we go somewhere, every time we do something, every time we say something, there is an absolute divine purpose and will for it. 
that I never again feel like I'm, I've wasted a day or wasted my life or wasted a year or wasted my time somewhere. But that I live in your purpose and in your will every single second of every single day. Love you, Jesus. Transform me with that truth, I pray. In your holy name.